Any questions on those homeworks? All right. Let's see. Uh, so far, we did a real quick one-day uh, review of uh, rectilinear motion. Remember, this is strictly one-dimensional motion. So, even if we have a, a track on an object has to follow, which you think would be kind of like one dimension, you can either go this way on the track or that way on the track, that's not rectilinear motion because the track itself exists in two dimensions. So that will be what we'll look at now, which is curvilinear motion. So what we looked at with the rectilinear motion, that was strictly 1D. It could even, it could only go left or it could go right as if it was on a train track and could, and, and the train track that uh, was a concern was very, very straight. No turns, no elevation changes, um, just out and back, nothing else. Now we'll do a little bit more with it. We'll do it in a couple different ways. We'll start with the usual that we're most familiar with. We'll look at it in Cartesian coordinates. Not a not a, a, a terribly big deal. That's what we did in physics one. That's kind of how people think about the world anyway. For the most part, everybody orients them themselves, at least maybe in their mind's eye, with the north and south and east and west. And then no matter what you need to do, you do it within that, that two-dimensional plane defined by the uh, those ordinal directions. We'll also look at a different uh, coordinate system called uh, normal tangential. This will be particularly useful for uh, uh, a certain types of um, sort of uh, sort of regular and controlled two D motion, as we'll see. And then we'll briefly touch on uh, polar coordinates, which is. Uh, uh, another way to look at uh, at 2D 2D motion that for certain problems is, is can be can be quite an advantage. All right, so we'll we'll begin with the with the Cartesian business. As usual, as it did with cart with the rectilinear motion, it all depends upon some defined, agreed upon origin, someplace from where we measure everything. Where that is, that nah, doesn't really matter. Whatever's uh, of, of particular use to a problem, that'll be good enough. At that origin, then we'll stick uh, a simple Cartesian coordinate system. Typically, though we do not need to, we'll put X horizontal to the left and right, and Y vertically, up and down. Uh, and and unless uh, it lends itself to a particular problem to do otherwise. We'll even take right to be positive, up to be positive. Uh, but we can do anything we want. Because remember, the origin as well as the orientation of the coordinate system is arbitrary and whatever is of most use to us in the problem. So once we've established uh, a coordinate system from where we can measure things, we can well then, measure things. So here's an object uh, at point one. And we might then give it a position vector that we might call R1 that locates it at some time. Maybe we even want to be so creative as to call that at time T1. Now we're, we're looking again at uh, curvilinear motion. So we're going to exist in this 2D plane of the board or in your paper, however it looks. And so there may or may not be some path that's defined. Uh, the object has to go from one place to another in some way, so it's certainly going to follow a path. We may or may not know what that path is. But uh, we can take it as, as that, and it'd be as simple as that. Once we've done that, 
we can then define from that the components of that vector. So this might, let's see, might call this R1 in the x direction. This we might call R1 in the y direction. And then we'll be able to use all of our regular trigonometry to define all of this in any way that we want. And so this R1 vector we might call as uh, made up of two orthogonal vector components. So we could do that with it. I'm not a real fond of, uh, not a real fan of using too many levels of subscripts if we can avoid it. I would hate to go much farther than two, but if I can even avoid two layers of subscripts or even one layer of subscripts, I'm happy to. So there's other things we could call this that would be just as instructive. We, uh, we might call it, uh, well, if this is R in the X direction, we might just call it X. Maybe uh, if we're worried about a couple different places, we'll call it one. Uh, that'll save us a little bit. But again, it's all just notation. Uh, that The sole purpose of doing that would be to save us one level of subscript. We, uh, we might want to call that a vector component itself, a vector itself, or we might also use the unit vector notation with which I hope you're all familiar. Looks familiar. Um, everybody remember it for the most part? Alex, you remember? We did that in physics one, right? The, the, the unit notation. Uh, and then we might call this then Y1 because we're talking about the first position again. J. Just make sure that your I's and your J's look different. It's very common for some students to not make them look visibly different enough and then you and I run into trouble going over this work. So we got all kinds of possibilities like that. All right, uh, other stuff that might be going on. Let me just clean this up a little bit because I'm going to need some room with it. So here's our arbitrarily chosen coordinate system from which we define everything. If we want to, we can remind ourselves that we've got unit vectors that define themselves with that coordinate system. Remember, those are, those are used just to give scalar components a directional uh, quantity to it. All right, so we've got, we've got some path we're following here and an object at some point R1, we might call it. And at that instant, the object following that path will have some velocity which we might call V1. It must be at any instant, by definition of the path, it must be tangential to the path. If there's any component to the velocity that's not tangential to the path, that's orthogonal, that's perpendicular to the path, then that component of the velocity is going to take it off the path. It must. It's uh, no different than you driving down a highway. If you have any component of the velocity, of your velocity sideways to the direction the road's running, you're going to leave the roadway. Some of you like to do that on purpose. Others don't. So we can relate these, this velocity, is the time rate of change of the position vector. Or 
if we'd like, we can use the dot notation. But it's also the time rate of change of p to the component direction. So maybe we'll call it x1 dot i plus y1 dot j. Uh, staying away from the r1x notation, which can in itself get to be a little bit of a pain. But all of these mean the same thing if we want to. We mean to be x. I plus V, G, Y, J, and all of the other possibilities that could go with it. Any of those are fine, recognizable. You might want to sort of zero in on one in particular and stick with it. Uh, some are more useful than others at, in certain problems, as we'll see shortly here, I think. But uh, you're welcome to use any one of the different types of different possibilities and notation for the very same thing in whatever makes you comfortable with it. All right. Sometime later, we might be at some other spot, point two, and there'd be a position vector. I'm not going to draw that because the thing can get a little too crowded if I do. And we have a tangential velocity at that instant. Maybe we'll call V2. Maybe the magnitude of V1 and V2 are the same. Clearly, the directions are different. Maybe the magnitudes are the same. Maybe they're not. It depends entirely on whatever problem we're doing. But once we have that, uh, of course, we can define an average acceleration just like we did in Physics 1. Defined as the change in the velocity vector with time. Delta T being whatever time it took us to go from 1 to 2. But that velocity vector is very strictly V2 minus V1 over that delta t, where this is a full vector equation, must be treated as such, must be kept as such. It makes no sense if we have equal signs in here, if one part's a vector and the other part isn't. So if uh, we have a vector equation in one part, we have a vector equation in all parts. Well, we can, we can look and see just exactly what that means. Here's V2. We'll add to it the negative of V1. Let's see, V1 is like that. The negative of V1 looks like that. Then we have a change in velocity vector. That must be parallel to and in the same direction as the average acceleration vector. So now we know that, that in between points 1 and point 2, we have an average acceleration vector in the same direction as the change in velocity vector. just like we would have done before. Um, <clears throat> I do negative V1 because I personally, when I'm subtracting vectors, get confused of what tail goes to what tail and then which direction the resultant goes. And if I do V2 minus V1 drawn this way, I just never mess up and I always get the right direction for delta V. That's just a uh, Maybe my mental shortcoming. Maybe you can subtract vectors a, a little less haphazardly than I can. Uh, you're welcome to do so. That's just uh, one of my little mental foibles. You can Google that word later. Of course, we're going to be interested in the 
instantaneous acceleration, which is the acceleration you can get at any one instant as this uh, time period goes down to a single speck in time. And that then, of course, is uh, just the straight time derivative of the velocity vector with all the other notations. None of this is any different, or uh, at least the what's up here, really, none of this is different than what we had in um, the rectilinear motion. The fact that we've gone from one dimension to two has not really changed things greatly other than the fact that before our direction in one dimension is either a plus or a minus. Now in this case we have uh, the, the, the full 2D flavor of a, the possibility of a, of, a, of a vector in 2D space. Other possibilities for this, we can break it into its component directions just like we could with the other one and using any of the notation that you so choose. And all the, uh, all the variations thereof. Vx dot, Vy dot, X double dot, I, Y double dot, J, whatever, whatever of those notations looks uh, the yummiest to you. CJ got a favorite? All right. Uh, the acceleration vector itself, of course, can also have the x and the y components, and we'll have to take care of, of all of those as we go. Even though the, the velocity vector will never have any uh, normal component to the path, it can only be tangential to the path, that's not true of the acceleration vector, as we've simply seen here. There is a component that's along the path as well as a, a component that's across the path. So uh, the, there's, there's more stuff that comes into the acceleration than what we had before in 1D motion. All right, so we're going to look at a particular type of uh, curvilinear motion, just like we did in Physics 1. We're going to revisit this, and that's the uh, idea of projectile motion. motion as we're going to look at it is a free fall problem. That should mean one thing most certainly to all my students who from Physics 1 and uh, for those of you I didn't have from Physics 1 will remind you of it. Just may not have been put so uh, succinctly so, so explicitly as I tried to do for my Physics 1 students. Jake, you nodded your head. That mean, that word free fall means one thing when you hear it. Acceleration due to gravity is constant? Uh, that's sort of a subset of the one thing you need to know. You need to know something uh, actually a little bit more general and then that falls from it. Acceleration is constant? No. I mean it is, yes. The acceleration is constant, but uh, you need something more than that. What? And you were saying, wait, yeah, gravity is the only force in the problem. That means we neglect air resistance. 
as you've seen in lots of these problems. They'll say even something in the problem like neglecting air resistance, and then they go ahead and lay out the rest of the problem. We will look briefly in this uh, a little bit later in the, the term uh, at what we do to include air resistance in, in a fairly simple way uh, as an extra exercise in it. All right, gravity being the only force, then gravity, uh, the gravitational acceleration is the only acceleration we have. It's in the y direction. And unless you'd rather, we'll take the downward direction as the negative direction. You may have any severe protests. Bob, even you're okay with Alan? Okay, so we'll arbitrarily then put in a minus sign. That's just the agreement between us that we'll take downward as the negative direction. We don't have to. It's an arbitrary decision. Um, but like good minions, you do what I say. And I said minus, so you felt followed along with it. And it'll have a field strength of G. We'll take G to be either, in general, 9.81 meters per second squared or 32.2 feet per second squared, unless told otherwise in one of the problems. We did look at chapter one a little bit of what happens with, with the different altitudes and different places on the globe and other kinds of things that can affect that. But unless we, uh, it's specifically said otherwise, we'll take those to be the values in here. Notice, I hope, G itself does not have a negative sign on it. This is the gravitational field strength. Um, most of you are in physics three now, so you're going to start, if you haven't already, you're going to start talking about field, field strengths. Uh, you'll talk about the uh, electric field, the magnetic field, and the like. So you'll know a little bit about that. Uh, it just tells us if we had a small mass and let go of it in the gravitational field, it would achieve this acceleration. If we go to some other place in the planet, like we looked at some other altitude, some, and let go of that same mass, it would have a slightly different acceleration as we looked at in, in chapter one. This negative sign, we arbitrarily imposed. So it goes in front of the G once we've made our coordinate decision, but G itself never has a negative sign in it because that's uh, arbitrarily imposed by us, whereas these values are not. All right, so uh, if we wanna be a little bit more explicit we could even uh, make this a vector, make sure that we've got it right. We know then uh, what the acceleration is. We'll take this to be, as well, a constant. So now, anytime we're looking at some kind of projectile motion, it doesn't matter where we start, it doesn't matter what our initial velocity is, it doesn't matter where we land. All of it shakes out to be exactly the same for any projectile motion problem. It all depends on some initial velocity, which may or may not have some angle to it. Doesn't matter. I'll, uh, I have to draw something, so I'll draw that. But it doesn't matter what theta is. Theta can be anything from 0 to 360, and all of this shakes out to be exactly the same type of thing. In the presence of a gravitational field, an object with some kind of velocity, something like that, 
will tend to follow a parabolic path through 2D space. Realistic looking, isn't it? it makes you feel like you're there. Actually, it kind of looks like you're peeing off a cliff. That's why I don't use yellow chalk. But any projectile problem we look at, whether or not the launch site is above the landing site, whether or not it's to the left or to the right of the landing site, whether or not there's a zero theta launch angle or uh, 132 degree, none of it matters. It all turns out to be exactly the same type of problem. It's just a matter of us getting a projectile motion problem looking at what the given quantities are and then putting them all into the exact same equations. Those being split between the horizontal motion and the vertical motion. There's two different things going on in the two directions. Actually, uh, Actually, the same thing's going on in the horizontal as in the vertical motion. Um, it's just that because of what the values are, things uh, get greatly simplified on the horizontal side. On the horizontal side, <coughs> the acceleration is constant as such the constant acceleration equations apply. Uh, by the way, I did put up the, the constant acceleration sheet on Angel. I don't know if you had, you asked for it, right, I think, for another copy of that. So if you go to Angel, the constant acceleration equations are there. Um, we do have constant acceleration in the horizontal side. It happens to be zero. So any of those constant acceleration equations apply, but any of them that have A in them, you have to put in a value of A equals zero. What that means is we're only left with a single, uh, really one single horizontal equation, uh, one single constant acceleration equation, and that's because, let's see, if the acceleration in the x direction is zero, then the velocity in the x direction is constant. Of course, this isn't true in the vertical direction because we have this constant downward acceleration. So the velocity in the y direction is not constant. And it's the 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 con those two conditions constant horizontal velocity, non-constant vertical velocity, but with constant acceleration, it causes the parabolic motion of uh, the, the standard projectile through space. Since the velocity is constant, then that's the only constant acceleration equation there is at our disposal. None of the others uh, are useful. If you go to any of the other constant acceleration equations, put in A equals zero, then you get something ordinary and identical like V1 equals V2, which of course it does if the velocity is constant and that's no help as, a, as one of the equations. So that's all we've got on the vertical side. If you'd rather, and this is one time when I prefer to do this, you can use the dot notation I like to do this because then it's a reminder that on the horizontal side we shouldn't see anything but an X there should be no Y's over here if you remember we separate the vertical and the horizontal with what? a semi permeable membrane yeah you didn't hear this before about this semi permeable membrane. Sounds important though. Yeah, it is. It's very important. It's, it's absolutely crucial. 
as we'll get to, we'll, we'll tell you why it's semi-permeable membrane in a second. Um, also, because it's constant, if we have it as given, uh, we can then also establish that in terms of the initial velocity. Um, of course, those are both constant. Once the object's been la launched, you can't change the initial velocity and the angle of launch because it's already in the air. So of course, of course those two things are constant. But that's the entire setup for the horizontal side of the equation. On the vertical side, we've got this business that uh, we have a non-zero acceleration if you wish, you can use the dot notation. But then the, uh, the velocity is not constant, and it will be a function of the initial horizontal velocity plus any change in that velocity due to the acceleration. That actually is just one of the constant acceleration equations. This is that the acceleration is defined as the change in the velocity with time. That's all that equation is. There's nothing magic to it. It's just one of the constant acceleration equations. Jake, did you have a hand up? Yeah. Um this is probably just derived from the constant acceleration problems, but isn't on the horizontal, um, isn't um, the uh, delta x equal to like um, dxt? Is that or there was like another? Delta x yep. is equal to vx. Okay, yep, oh, there it is. Okay. Right there. Sorry. It's, <laughs> it's the only constant acceleration equation that's left. Remember, one of the constant acceleration equations was the average velocity is the change in position divided by the time. All the other constant acceleration equations drop out, as do uh, as all other constant a acceleration uh, constant a equations apply. So I, there's no need to write them down. You can write them. You can write them down. You may want to put them in the dot formation because, once again, this visually emphasizes that on the vertical side, there are only allowed things with the letter Y in them. On the horizontal side, we only allow things with the letter X in them. We strictly practice, in this class, segregation. It's, it's a, it's a it's an absolute necessity in this curvilinear motion that we keep the horizontal motion separate from the vertical motion. They're both happening at the same time, but they do not interfere with each other in any way. We just simply add them together. As a semi-permeable membrane, that implies that some things can cross from one side to the other. And there are three things that can be found on either side of the equation, uh, either side of the, the semi-permeable membrane. <coughs> Only three things can cross, pass through that membrane. That's why it's semi-permeable. Time. Time. These two things are happening at the same time, so any time value you use over here, you use over here at the same uh, for the for the same uh, part of the motion. So we'll let go back and forth the time. Semi-permeable membrane. And let some stuff go through but not others. No X's can go that way. No Y's can come this way. Jake, one of the others? Uh, the angle. The angle, because that can play a part in either one of those because uh, this establishes the entire velocity in the horizontal direction. 
it also establishes the initial velocity for the uh, vertical motion. And the third thing that can pass back and forth between this, uh, through this semi-permeable membrane. What? Oh, no, there's always units. The units don't go anywhere. The, the units, they're, they're, they're if, if you bring over a value for that, it's got to have the units with it automatically. They're inseparable. DJ? The initial velocity, uh, the magnitude of the launch velocity itself. Any of the other constant acceleration equations apply. Um, so no need to delineate them. Once you once you realize what you're been, what you've been given here, then you solve that side like a constant any other constant acceleration equation. Nothing else matters. This is true for any launch velocity. No matter what the angle, no matter what the magnitude, even uh, if theta could be 90 degrees, which is one of those problems where the object goes straight up and straight down and goes back to a, a rectilinear motion problem. It doesn't matter if uh, theta is greater than 90 or even greater than 180. Well, if it's greater than 90, we just have a picture that's been flipped around. There's nothing nothing to worry about it. Uh, it's just, it's the it's, uh, very same problem that the class on the other side of the wall is seeing as, as in our alternate universe over there, where your alter egos are. It also doesn't matter if we happen to have a launch velocity that's got it, that's downward and we follow that kind of projectile. It doesn't matter. All of the problems are solved in the same way. So, let's do one. It doesn't mean the problems aren't phrased differently and don't ask for different things and have different things given, but they're all done in exactly the same way. Alright, let's, uh, let's start out with a real straightforward one. Here's our little clip. Huh? That's okay, I'll play the dick back. In fact, I, you know, I think I'll just get a directional mic and just focus it right there. You can say all you want and I'll catch it. Alright. 110 meter high cliff. Uh, in fact, I did this uh, just over the weekend in my backyard because we have uh, we have that that cliff in our yard. These are we'll take in this case theta be ninety degrees just to get us started. Fifteen meters per second. All right. So stand at the top of the cliff. You throw your little brother straight up in the air. Remember, uh, we are not concerned in this case, uh, since it's never appeared anywhere. It can't be a concern with the with the mass of whatever it is that the, is the object. Uh, we're not talking here strictly about what the forces are. Just the force of gravity is the only one. All right, simple problem. Find the maximum height it travels uh, above the base of the cliff. These solves still apply. 
It's just in this case, the horizontal velocity is zero. So this entire side drops out. There's nothing to do with the horizontal side. It's all gone since both the acceleration and the velocity are zero. All we've got to work with is that side, the, the uh, vertical side. It's a constant acceleration problem, which, if you remember, means three things are given. One thing is not, and that's how you decide which of the constant acceleration equations to use. What three things are given in terms of the vertical motion? Since we've already come to understand the horizontal motion is completely out of the picture. You've got the initial vertical velocity given as 15 meters per second. What else is given? Sorry, Pat. Position. As? 100 meters. Is, uh, I don't know. I don't know. What is the initial position? I should do it the way you said. Initial position. You said about three things, I think. Yeah. You started to argue with I mean, yourself. You could say 110, or you could say zero. You just have to well, which is right? Either if you get the right answer, right? What, DJ? We're going from space. What's right? What's the right thing to put down for the initial position? Depends on where you put your origin. Depends on where you put your origin. Where's your origin? What did I tell you about the origin? Where's it got to be? Wherever you want it. So, Pat, you spoke up first. It's arbitrary. Just put it somewhere, agree to it, and then don't move it. All right, you're just going to say y equals zero is there. So our initial position then is zero. And in fact, anywhere it is from there, will be uh, just the, the part that we need since Pat conveniently chose the uh, initial position as the as our origin. So that just makes things a little bit simpler. What's the third thing that's given? say so, but I'm assuming there that down from there is negative, up from there is positive. Doesn't have to be, but we're all pretty used to that. So, three things given. You need to find, find what? Find we need to find find the maximum height. Find delta y maximum. Okay. A little bit of a trouble here if we're if we're not careful. Uh, this initial position is not actually part of the constant acceleration equation. Delta y is part of the equation. Uh, Pat's conveniently chosen them for us, but we have not been given uh, the third part we need for the 
maximum acceleration or for the uh, constant acceleration equations. So we need one more piece of information because nowhere in the constant acceleration equations is y zero appear. Do we? We need the information that defines this point of maximum height. So that's actually our third given, that the velocity, uh, we'll call it 2, I guess, and then it'll fall from there if we let it. Y2 is 0. We want to find the, the, the height where the velocity itself is zero. So those are the three things that we want to use for the constant acceleration equation. Only one equation has those three things, so that's one you use. Check your tattoo. Good work. You got it already? Yep. <laughs> What's so funny? Uh, I just didn't feel like going back. I didn't get that tattoo yet. Frank, you got your tattoo? Uh, got the constant. Do you guys have your constant acceleration sheets? Maybe not your tattoo? It's at home. I got to grab it. <clears throat> so you can write it on the board, right off the side where they can't see that camera. Right. Well, like reference the rest of the semester. I, I don't know if I have a copy of them in here. acceleration equations. And if you go to Angel, this this exact page will show up there. So we have a problem with initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration, and we're trying to find position. So we have um, Initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration, and we're trying to find position. So that's the only equation that will work directly right there. Three things you know, three things we didn't know, so there's only one equation that will work for us. Doesn't that seem useful as a tattoo, Frank? Uh, yeah. Does 
to have it right there on your forearm or something? I, I have it on my uh, the inside of my eyelids. And I blink, I read it, there it is. I've got every course I've ever taken is there. So we know V2 squared equals V0 squared using the same notation we had over here. Uh, minus 2G delta Y. And then we can solve that for delta Y. That's what we were looking for. Did it work? That's what you did? Colin? Okay. What'd you get? 11.5. You shouldn't have, as long as you're careful with everything else, you shouldn't have any uh, any danger about the possibility of a minus or a plus sign is here. Sometimes we do with the with the time. If we have to use this equation, see if we have a quadratic in time, you have a choice you need to make of the plus or the minus sign. In fact, any questions on that before I clear it? Let's do the next part of this problem. And figure out the time when it hits the, the base of the cliff.
Uh, we could put delta y from 0 to 2. This is from 0 to 3. And it's crucial that we make note of the fact that it finished 110 meters below where it started. Doesn't matter what else it did in between. So when we have uh, separate problems, separate places, a uh, judicious choice of uh, notation can make problems a little bit simpler. So which equation involves these three things and the time? We have initial velocity, we have the distance it traveled, start to finish, we have the acceleration and we have the time there. So the equation we want Quadratic solver on there. Quadratic equation solver. Uh, no? Doesn't anybody? Alex, no, you don't have the quadratic equation solver on there? Yeah, it's not correct. Well, you can remember the quadratic equation too. That'd make a darn good tattoo. What do we? If you put in the um, find the change in y as a negative, so we're going to bring over the quadrant, because that's a negative square. Shouldn't. Let's see. Uh, let's go ahead and fill out all the pieces on our quadratic. Let's see, we're working right in meters. Plus. 15 meters per second t. That's the minus one half at squared plus vit. And if we bring that over, it's plus 110. So that's the quadratic equation we need to solve with m a. That's the genetic c, right? So, what, did you make a mistake, Doobie? Yeah. Okay. Forgot what? Negative on the G. Oh. Yeah, be careful. What's the problem? Did it work? Well, hang on, let's do one problem at a time. Right now, we've got laid out doing it from zero to three. You could do it from two to three. Yeah. It's just these, these uh, the values might change. Because now you have a different initial velocity for that time period. Remember that when we talk about initial and final velocities, we're talking about a particular chosen time period. Pardon me? No different change Yep. But you should get the same answer. So we have quadratic in time. So we should get, as with most quadratic equations, two answers. The two answers? You got to you got to look at them both because until you have both answers written down, both roots written down, how are you going to know which one's right and you didn't just happen to pick one to start with that wasn't right? So you need to look at both answers. Quadratic and 
equation solver. Or learn how to program. It's not that difficult to program these things. Even I've done that. And I hate those things. Two roots. Remember, there could be two. There could be one. There could be none. But for this type of problem, I can't imagine what would have happened for us to have no roots. But we could certainly have two roots. Got two, Alex? Do you have two? Did you check? Yeah. Alex? Do you have Turn and smile at her. Get three four. One root. Colin, what do you have? Two seconds. What do we have? 6.5 seconds, I think I heard. And? Negative 3.4 seconds. Fairly obviously, only one makes any sense in this case. That being the 6.5 seconds. Is there any meaning to the minus 3.4 seconds? The minus 3.4 seconds tells us, uh, well, there's two different ways to look at it. It's the time it would have taken for a projectile to start down here, go up to this point, pass that point, as long as it passed with the same velocity, 15 meters per second passing that point, it would still go to the same height and then still take an extra 6.5 seconds to come down. So it would have taken 3.4 seconds to get to here if it went with that same velocity and then it'll take 6.5 seconds to come to the bottom. What's the initial velocity down here that would give us that? I don't know. We don't have that number. Or you can look at it as the time it would take if we shot downward with 15 meters per second, how long it would take to get to here. So there is physical significance to that. It's just for this problem we're not concerned with. All right, we're going to change things a little bit. We'll keep that same launch velocity. Sorry, we'll keep that same launch speed. We're just going to knock it over a couple degrees. So still 15 meters per second, but now it's 78 degrees. So I want you to find a couple things. Find where it lands. and the velocity at impact. All right, so we want to find where it lands, commonly known as the range.
I also put up on Angel a projectile motion summary, just the very same things we've been going over for any initial velocity, the things that apply. Again, it's the same business on the vertical side. It's constant acceleration. Three things apply. Three things are given, one thing isn't. On the horizontal side, it's a constant velocity problem, which is a type of constant acceleration problem, just a very, very simple one. out the range, we're going to need that velocity, but we also need the time, amount of time it was in the air. How are you going to figure out the amount of time it was in the air? before it landed in this problem. We need the time to go with the velocity to find the range, how far down range it was when it landed. How are we going to find this time? this time so we can find out that range. The initial the velocity in the y direction or sorry x direction is no trouble. That's all given, you just need to figure it out. But how long how what time it was in the x direction, traveling in the x direction, we need to find this range. How can we find that? said without losing the vertical. Huh? In fact, remember I said that time is one of those things that can cross the membrane. So that's where it's going to need to come from. But it's even easier than that.
we do it in exactly the same way we did it before. Three things you're given. You're given the initial velocity in the y direction. You're given the change in position in the y direction. And you're given the acceleration in the y direction. From that, then, you can find the time that was in the air. Should it be the same time that we had in the problem we just did, the 6.5 seconds? Is this the same initial velocity we had with the problem we just did? The launch speed is the same. That Y component, the vertical component, is different now. That horizontal or vertical component there. Is different. VO is the same. But y dot o is not the same. Five minutes here to fix this one up. You got it? Who did you check with? No one. Still not talking to anybody. Furthering and fostering the notion that engineers are socially inept. Frank, who did you talk to? Have you, have you met anybody in here yet besides me? in the longer in the air longer or shorter than before shorter there's less vertical velocity now and that's what determines how long it's in the air
6.47 seconds in the air? That's what they got. time in the air, which you get from the vertical side, then you can bring that over. Constant velocity in the x direction, and you're all set. 